Thank you very much for, for coming to IISS. Uh, thank you to Dr. Al Sulami for accepting our invitation. So Dr. Al Sulami is an expert and researcher on Iranian affairs. He received his PhD from Leiden University in 2014. Uh, your PhD investigates the notion of the other in modern Iranian South. And you're also interested in Iranian Arab political, cultural, and social relationships. You are a professor of Iranian studies at Umm al Qura University, and uh, you are also a freelance consultant for many official authorities in Riyadh on all <coughs> political, economic, and social effects, uh, aspects of Iranian affairs. You are nowadays uh, the head of RASANA, the International Institute for Iranian Studies, and chief editor in chief of jo the Journal of Iranian Studies. Um, so I also would like to thank all of you for coming uh, to this event. And we are finally delighted, delighted to welcome our new executive director, General Tom Beckett, who is here today and will start in his new position around mid-May. Thank you very much. So you have the floor, Dr. Sulaim. Assalamu uh, alaikum, Masal Khair. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for IS, uh, IISS for uh, having me and uh, share ideas with you today. Uh, I would like to start with talking about the, the briefly about the relation between Saudi Arabia and Iran. In order to understand the current situation, we have to look back for a uh, period of time and then go and forward and see what, what's going on now in the region. Uh, before the revolution, the relation between Iran and its neighboring countries, and especially with Saudi Arabia, was uh, to large extent, good relation, although there were some ups and downs during the relation, especially from 19, we had the problem in, in the relation between Iran and Saudi Arabia in 1944 to 1947. We, have, uh, we had a problem during the late 1960s. Uh, the, the, the Emirati, uh, three Emirati islands, the situation of Bahrain, we are here in Manama today. So we had, several problems with the Iranian uh, Pahlavi period, but it was kept in the political canal. It's, it wasn't involving the, the sectarian issue, it wasn't involving the, uh, or using minorities for political purposes. After the revolution, Saudi welcomed actually what, what, what uh, the development in Iran and the choice of the Iranian people and uh, uh, King Khalid uh, uh, talked about that in 1987, uh, 1979, in the Arab summit in, in Tunis. And uh, his reaction was positive. But afterward, we had, we witnessed several developments in terms of the relation between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Mostly negative. We start. We we we've started seeing Iranian protests or slogan during the Hajj period, and developed until 1987. What happened in 1987? You know, uh, many people, uh, religious, uh, people from different countries uh, and from Iranians were killed in in, in, in during the the, the Iranians uh, riot in in, in Mecca. Uh, the second period, I would say it's the Rafsanjani and Khatami period. It is what they call the reformist government in Iran. We can call King Abdullah when he was the crown prince and, and uh, Rafsanjani, Hashim Rafsanjani, the engineers of, of the relation between Saudi Arabia and Iran. They had a very good, actually, personal relationship. Uh, when Rafsanjani used to visit Saudi Arabia, he used to visit the king in his house. Sometimes they stay in the, in the, in the house of King Abdullah. And when King Abdullah visited Iran, when he came to Brinstel in 1997, he visited uh, Rafsanjani in his house and they stayed there for, I think, uh, over a night. So during the Khatami period, the relation developed more. And we've seen uh, uh, politi good political relation, economic relations, uh, uh, different uh, officials come from Iran to visit Saudi Arabia and vice versa as well. 
So uh, myself, I, I visited Iran in 2000. I spent a uh, summer there. I studied. Uh, I tried to improve my Persian language in, during in 2000, still BA student at that time. And later, in, in 2004, I did my MA at Tehran University. This is during Muhammad, uh, Muhammad Khatami period. So that was kind of positive relation, good relation, but it was dangerous at the same time. Why is that? Uh, the government in Iran, because I will come to that point, but now, uh, Khatami really maybe was sincere in terms of improving the relation with neighboring countries. But the deep, what you can say, deep state or the more strong state in Iran, which is the revolutionary guard, Khamenei uh, people, tried to misuse the, the opening up towards Iran from Arab countries, and especially from Gulf countries, as, as well from Sudan, Yemen, uh, Morocco, and different countries. So they came behind the, this opening towards Iran and tried to, to plant their own cells in different countries. And now when I meet with some Iranian friends, we talk about this, they admitted that we couldn't do much because actually this is the Revolutionary Guard and the government couldn't do much. So the result came afterwards when Khatan, um, Ahmadinejad took, uh, the, um, became a president in 2005 and in, Again and again, it came getting, going from bad to worse until 2011. And especially with, with the, the Syrian uh, uh, issue. When Khat and Khamenei uh, went to Juma prayer and uh, delivered the speech in Arabic, asking the uh, Arab nations to revolt against their governments. But when it came to the Syrians, they said it is a Zionist or, or a Zionist American uh, attempt to, to destroy what they call the resistance uh, front, or Jabhat al Muqawama. Going from this, uh, we can talk also about uh, the. Uh, so that's what we were talking about. Now, it, if, we, if we talk about. Uh, the 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 Saudi the main problem let's say between the Saudi Arabia Saudi Arabia and Iran when I visit some uh, Western institutes there was most of them not all of them talk about uh, Sunni and Shia conflict we know the problem between Saudi Arabia and Iran it is a Shia Sunni it is a sectarian issue and. That's why it involves the, the political issues in it. But this is, in my opinion, not a, a real understanding of the situation and the problem with the political system in Iran. Iran has been a Shia since 1501, since the Safavi period, 1501. During the Qajar period, there was a Shia, 12 as well. During the Shah period, there was a Shia. Although, as I said, we had sometimes difficulties, but we could manage these problems and try, both sides tried to solve the problem without involving other parts, uh, parties or other issues, like, as I said, sectarian issues or, 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 uh, pro but or uh, ideological issues, like Wilayat al Faqih. The main problem, in my opinion, in, in terms of uh, the relation with Iran now uh, is, I wouldn't say it, a Shia Sunni, as, as I said, it is an ideological problem. Wilayat uh, al-Faqih, superior leadership in, in Iran, something new in the Shia belief, to begin with. Before 1979, nobody talks about the Wilayat al-Faqih. The concept doesn't exist, although some people talked about it in, nine, in, in late 19th century, but it wasn't developed to be a political ideology. Uh, after the revolution, the Khamenei tried to, to, to to do, develop this, and even before, in his writings, of course, but Khomeini, yes, thank you. Uh, Khomeini tried 
in, in, when he was in Iraq and afterward, try to develop the, his ide uh, political uh, ideology, you can call it, and try to, to put the religious and political parts together. So a religious figure can lead the country, but he's still in a position higher than the government. So he needs everything, but he, when it comes to the, the political problems, they say, okay, I have nothing to do with the, the political situation. You have to deal with the government. At the same time, the government cannot control two main files, foreign policy and this national security. When you come to these two points, Rouhani, Ahmadinejad, Khatami, or even Zarif now as the Minister of Foreign Affairs, they cannot uh, like give a promise or to develop something or to have a, a, a better relation. You have, they have to take the promotion from Khamenei first, and then we've seen this during the, the negotiation uh, about the, the uh, five plus, P5 plus one, the, the nuclear <coughs> issue. We remember Kha, Kha, uh, Zarif used to sometimes go over the night, go to Tehran, and then come back to, to Lausanne or to Vienna, to different cities. So, so they, they cannot deliver. They cannot deliver as a government. So they have to take the promotion from Khamenei office, from Khamenei himself. So this is the, the, the real situation. That comes to, to the real situation with Iran. With which part we can deal? In Iran, shall we deal with the government or uh, with, with what I call the, the deep state or revolutionary state, uh, the revolutionary guard uh, and and Khamenei office and the called conservatives? Although I don't really believe uh, in in those divisions, the people use it like reformists in Iran. Um, some people in the middle and conservatives. In my opinion, uh, those groups belong, these three, these three groups belong to one part in Iran, which is the conservatives. But it has been divided into three main parts. But you cannot see uh, seculars, uh, liberals, in, in the government. So they are excluded excluded, and, and, and they aren't not in, the, in a part of the government. What do you mean? Uh, so they use these three divisions. The, uh, I will come to the main point, but now I just we remember, if you see the Iranian lobby in the West, especially in, DC, in Washington, D.C., they say to American uh, po uh, you know, politicians or to the media as well, as you have Republicans and, and, and Democrats, we in Iran have these three divisions. So you should support Rouhani in order to weaken Khamenei and his party. And this has been used for many times, especially during the, the nuclear uh, issue. So remember uh, uh, the Iranian lobby in, in DC, they always has been saying that if you want to make a change inside Iran, you have to support Rouhani and his team in order to limit the, uh, uh, the space ha the Revolutionary Guard has or Khamenei himself has. Uh, and that's what happened in 2009 as well. It's exactly the same. Don't involve, don't do anything, don't even talk about it in the media because that will give a chance to, to Khamenei to finish everything because this is, uh, you know, uh, this is something uh, outsider uh, and they involve their involvement in, in internal issues. So, uh, is it uh, uh, then the problem with Iran, as I said, it is not a, a sectarian issue. That is very important. Our problem with well, our main problem with Iran that we we don't know with which part we deal. If we deal with the Revolutionary Guard, then what is the position of the government? Rouhani and the main government, that's its legitimate government recognized in the United Nations and other parts. Uh, 
so we, we ignore the government because they cannot deliver, and then we deal with revolutionary guards. Uh, this makes, that makes the problem more worse. If we deal with the government, with, with Rouhani and Zarif, they give, they give very good promises in media and everywhere. The good speech say that we want to improve the relation. We, are, we would like to have a better relation with, with the, the neighboring countries, especially Saudi Arabia and, uh, and other Arab countries. We are ready for negotiation and for opening a new page in the relation. But can they deliver? They can't. Uh, at the same time, when they give these promises, you see the other side, the Revolutionary Guard, give statements in the media and sometimes in newspapers and TVs and sometimes actions in Bahrain, in Eastern Province, Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, in different countries. It's uh, contradicting with what the government says. In my opinion, that part, this side, the, the Revolutionary Guards, represents the real political system in Iran. The, the revolutionary state, expansionist re regime that's willing to interfere in other countries. Uh, when it comes to, to, to their project, or to call it exporting the revolution, for instance, uh, people think it is a, a myth. But reality, it is not a myth. It is a project. They have their own aims. They have their own uh, goal to achieve in the region. And they work for it. Uh, Khomeini used to say the way to, to Quds goes where? Through Karbala, which means through uh, Iraq and other Arab countries to reach to, to Jerusalem or Quds. Uh, but they couldn't do that. They couldn't achieve it. They, there was a war between Iraq and Iran, as you know, for eight years, but they couldn't cross the border. I mean, when they crossed, they, would, they were pushed back to go inside Iran. Uh, so they couldn't make uh, uh, a vacuum, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they couldn't go through, through a, a military. They couldn't push back the borders. So they have another, uh, then they came with another idea, which is Nadariyat Umar Qura, where they call it Nadariyat Umar Qura. The theory of Umar Qura has nothing to do with my university, by the way, but uh, it's a theory of Umar Qura, which means we have to encourage Muslim nations, or Muslim nation, Muslim world, to, to recognize Iran as the heart of Islamic world. But Muhammad Javad Larijani theory is well known uh, theory. But they couldn't achieve that because nobody will, will look to come and forget uh, about uh, Makkah. They will pray to Makkah five times a day, every Muslim, so they cannot recognize uh, Qom as, as the heart of Islamic world. Then they went to a third idea, which is the third wave, which is uh, the uh, uh, what they call it, uh, uh, geopolitical Shia, the Shia geopolitics, which uses, uh, trying to use uh, uh, Shia minorities to achieve their own political goal and ideological goal, use minorities to focus on the Shia minority in different countries for achieving their own political uh, goal in, 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 Arabic, in Arabic courts and Arabic countries. The same, they have the ideology, which is the hidden imam. Every, we Muslims, we believe there is an imam, comes the Mahdi al Mahdi al Muntadar, but it is not the one uh, uh, defined in the Iranian ideology, or Wilayat al Faqih, to be more precise, ideology, or, or, or literature. In their opinion, the hidden imam cannot appear, or cannot, uh, yeah, the, he cannot appear until the whole region full, and especially Mecca, full of uh, disaster and chaos. Because, and that's why they Allah ma'ajjil farajuh sharif. He has to, they pray to, to, uh, to appear as soon as possible. Uh, 
the border for the state, the hidden, st the uh, what they call the Dual Mahdawiya, or the the Mahdavi states, from Lebanon to Yemen, and why Yemen? Because they believe that one of the sub main supporter of the hidden Imam will appear from Yemen, they call the Yemani, and he will be a, a, the the right arm of, of the hidden Imam. People who do not accept this religious or ideological uh, opinion will believe in the other thing, which is the nationalistic ideas. From sea, again, from Lebanon north to Yemen in, in, in south. Exactly the same border. And why Yemen again? Because they believe, uh, or, or they use a, a, a real uh, a moment of the history, real uh, facts in the history, which is the pre-Islamic period, that Iran, for a short period, was in Yemen. And we know why they were in Yemen for a short period. And they say, OK, we were in Yemen. So from Yemen and Syria, this is the Sassanian Empire. So people will be encouraged more if they don't, if they don't believe the sectarian or ideological ideas, they will, will believe the, or will go for nationalistic ideas. Going back to the Saudi, that's important because you have to understand, or we have to understand the situation. Why Yemen and why Syria and Lebanon? So, when it comes to, to the Saudi-Iranian relation, again, back to Saudi perspective about Iran, I think Saudi is ready, and many of the Arab countries, are ready to have a better relation with Iran. We are ready, but we need steps in the ground, something in the ground that we can see that Iran is changing its behavior in the region. This is the main, the main uh, in my opinion, main, main idea. To change your, uh, when you say something, we can see it in the ground. But you, if you say, if you give uh, promises, like the government gives lots of promises to, to in media and uh, Rouhani, uh, sorry, Zarif has been writing lots of essays and obituaries in, in different uh, newspapers, in Al Jazeera, in Al Arabi 21, in New York Times, in different newspapers, to try to convince people that we are ready, but the Arabs are not ready. And the Saudi Arabia is not ready. They have their own problem inside. No, it's not this, it's not like that. It's just we need. When you say something, you apply it. When you give a promise, you deliver. Otherwise, we would repeat ourselves all the way and we have the same experience as we had it before. So we cannot uh, say we now open the relation with Iran because Rouhani is better than Ahmadinejad. In reality, in my opinion, Ahmadinejad was a real representative of the Iranian political system. He was an outspoken man. He really he represents the reality of the political system in Iran, not Zari, or, or not Rouhani. Rouhani tries to, to be nice, gives good promises, but he doesn't really represent the reality of the political system in Iran. So uh, if Iran uh, changes its behavior in the region, I think Saudi Arabia and many of Arab countries will be ready from next day to go forward and to build a relation with a better relation with, with, with Iran. And if it sorry to find my paper. And if Iran stops using minorities and sectarian issue. I think, as I said, our problem with Iran is not the Shia-Sunni conflict. We can coexist with Iran. We can have, with Shia in general. Shia have been in our countries for centuries. We had no problem in Bahrain. Bahrain is the best example of the coexist between Shia and Sunni. Qatar, uh, Iraq, al Ahsa in Saudi Arabia. Nobody even asks. I cannot say this to you because you know it. You live it here. You used to live it here in Bahrain. 
Nobody asks if you are Shia or Sunni. People live together, intermarriage between Sunni and Shia. You find the Shia and lives with the Sunni, next to the, to the Sunni. Nobody asks if, if you are Shia or what, what do you believe in. Kids play together. Uh, I remember Dr. Atrayil Arayyad, you know, the, the Shura, she, she was born in Bahrain. And she used, and she, she and now she's, uh, she used to be the, the uh, Shura member, uh, in Shura Council member in Saudi Arabia, or Majlis Shura. She says, we used to live together in Bahrain when we were kids. The, the Sunnis used to come to our Husseiniyah and stay with us. They didn't ask if, if, if it's, what does it mean to be a Husseiniyah. And there is something in the Sunni houses, we used to go there and we, we, we work, uh, we stay together and nobody asked. This is exactly the, this is the reality until 1979. I don't say it's the only revolution, uh, the, the, the revolution in Iran, but it is part of it. Uh, the other part is the political Islam. That's what we've seen in Saudi Arabia, uh, Juhayman and, uh, and uh, is it this time, yeah? Uh, so uh, political Islam in, so, uh, in both in Shia and Sunni parts. Uh, inflamed sectarianism in the region. And that's what we are suffering from right now in our countries. In, we see it in Bahrain, we see it in Saudi Arabia, we see the best example of it in Iraq and Syria now. Before, people have no problem in terms of, of sectarian issue to be Shia or Sunni. Another thing is uh, Iranian attempts to, to to develop their nuclear program. And we have no problem with the P5 plus one. And Saudi Arabia announced that that's, they are supporting the, the deal, yet it is not comprehensive. What the, the West concerns about it is different from our concerns. Our concern, yes, the nuclear issue has to be resolved. We have to stop Iran from achieving our, uh, to, uh, achieving their goals in, in terms of uh, produce the bomb, but that is for in five, maybe five, seven, eight, ten years. But our main problem is on a daily basis. Iranian interfering in, in our internal affairs. We see it in Bahrain, we see it in Iraq, Syria, Saudi Arabia. So you cannot limit the, the deal to the nuclear issue. Because the most important and difficult part of it is the, the Iranian behavior in the region. That's what we've seen it in everywhere. So if you limit the Iranian behavior side by side with, with, with the nuclear deal, we'll have a better relation. We'll have better goal, a better, better deal. So that we didn't see it. And that's why Iran thought if we achieve the, the deal with the West, the, the Arab countries will follow. So we should focus more on the West, and then the Arab countries have no choice but to obey and accept that. But reality is different because our concerns, as I said, are different from uh, the, uh, the deal, uh, not the deal itself, but the whole regime in Iran, the whole political system in Iran. What if the relation uh, between Iran and, and, and and Saudi Arabia improves. I think Iran will have very good, well, Iran, Iran have a soft power they never used. They have products, they have good environment, they have different priority of, of, in terms of the south different from the north, east from the, different from the west, summer, winter, any time you can visit Iran and can find a place where you can enjoy yourself, enjoy time there and spend your holiday. 1955, King Saud visited, in, visited Iran, maybe you know that, maybe. But a part of it, it's King Saud spent his holiday in Iran. That was in 1955. So the sectarian wasn't a problem. During Rouhani, Adurak, Khatami period, we've seen the Iranian products in the Saudi market. We've seen the Iranian uh, series, you know, in TV series, in, in, in some Arab uh, TV channels, like Maryam al Adra, uh, ma many of them. So they have a very good soft power, they didn't use it, 
or they use it for a limited, a very short time, but doesn't help them in achieving their goals. So if the relation improves, Iran can have more influence in the region, soft influence, really, but they don't have a model to present. That's the whole problem. They don't have a model that for improve, uh, you know, improving, uh, you know, uh, uh, developments in the countries. There is no no model to follow. That's the problem. The whole problem with Iran is just try to do it fair in other countries, but they don't have something convincing. That's this is a good model we can uh, adopt. We can it can influences in uh, uh, the different countries. This is the whole I think uh, uh, problem with 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 the, with the political system there. I believe that if 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 the relationship improves, uh, we'll have better economic relation, business, in terms of business between Saudi Arabia and, and the Gulf, maybe, mostly, with, with Iran. You can, we, have in, we used to have a Safola company in Iran, Saudi company, controls 40% of the food, Zeta Tabakh oil for, for cooking in Iran, and was an issue in Iran. But, we, we, could, we could have more better business relation with Iran. Iranians can uh, export their products to this, the, and we'll have very good market in the Gulf, especially in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. But that wouldn't really, we, ha, we, we don't see any attempts to, to improve the relation, unfortunately. Real attempts, that's, they really want to stop this struggle between the two sides, which doesn't benefit that neither Saudi Arabia nor Iran, both are losing in this situation. They have to, to reach a point where they can work together in terms of oil, uh, you know, OPEC, and, and in different, uh, uh, in the region, balancing the power in the region, but not like, not like what we see right now. I, I hope we have a better relation with Iran, but uh, I'm not that optimistic with the, the political system we have now in Iran, unless they change their own behavior in the region. And sorry for all of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. <laughs> I will have uh, one comment first and then two yeah. questions. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, my comment is about what you said about the relationship between Iran and Islam. Yeah. Uh, I will quote uh, the former presidential candidate, uh, the Iranian election in 2013, Ghulam Ali Adadadel. Adadadel, yes. Adadadel, you know, the Islamist philosopher, yes. you can say that. He said at the time that Iran is as important for Islam yes. as Greece for the West. So they try to put the Velayat e Fari into the religious history of the Muslim world. Yeah. So I think that something to take into account when dealing with what they, how they perceive uh, the theocracy, the Islamic Republic of Iran, how they define themselves. My first question will be about uh, what I perceive as a contra contradiction in mm -hmm. the discourse from Saudi Arabia, explaining on the one hand that the Islamic Re Republic is going to collapse, that is very weak, as the Crown Prince Mohammed Ben Salman said, mm. Iran has a weak army and is a weak country compared to Saudi Arabia. And on the other hand, saying that Iran is hegemonic in the region. Mm. So why do you fear the interference of Iran if is that weak inside? You talk about the export of the revolution outside, mm. but the revolution inside Iran is not that strong ideologically among the Iranian people. Mm -hmm. So, and you said also that the model does not fit for other Muslim society. Yeah. So I think there's a contradiction here between being weak inside and being so strong outside of Iran. Yes. And the second question about the economic cooperation, you talk about the trade, yeah. but not about OPEC. Mm. Iran and Saudi Arabia reached a deal uh, in November 2015 at OPEC to increase oil prices. Yes. So there's a potential here, I think, for cooperation, if you can explain further. Yeah, yeah. thank Thank you very much. Uh, in terms of the first question, uh, in my opinion, there is no contradictions because uh, the Iranian political system strategy is to exporting the problems from inside, outside. This has been seen since the revolution. 
If you go back to Iranian newspapers after the revolution, I have the, the whole archive from 1979 until 1991. And then you have internet, or maybe 95, then you have internet. They, they gave lots of promises to Iranian people. Gas will be for free. Uh, water will be for free. Uh, don't buy a house, we'll give you a free house as a, an Iranian citizen. This is an Iranian newspaper, that's Khomeini himself. They couldn't uh, deliver these promises to Iranian people inside. The, uh, beside that, of course, the promises given was given to, to ethnic and religious minorities inside Iran. We call about Kurds, the Blues, Arabs, Turkmen, and others. They gave them promises that the, the, relation, uh, the, the situation would be much better than it was before the revolution. But again, they couldn't deliver. They couldn't deliver to Iranian people inside. Look at the look at the the Iranian constitution itself. In, in the Article 12, it says Iran is uh, Iran believes in Islam or, or Islamic state, and, and uh, in the school of Twilfers or, or Jafar. And this article cannot be changed. I'm maybe slightly paraphrasing. It's exactly the same meaning. So they cannot, that means they are excluding non twilfers inside Iran. Not, so if you say, it seems that they are not Iranian. They are excluded from being Iranian. So if you are not a twilfer, for example, you cannot run for election. You cannot uh, have very high position in the government. So far, we don't have a Sunni minister in Iran and no ambassador. Uh, our ambassador in Iran in 2000, from 1998 to 2002, I guess, was Jamil Jishi, Dr. Jamil Jishi, if you know the name, uh, Shia, Shia Sunni. He was our Saudi ambassador to, to Iran. He was one of the best um, Saudi ambassadors in Iran, actually. Uh, so, Yes, they are trying to export the problem, so they are weak inside. If, if you cut those arms outside Iran, the, the militias, the groups outside, and you push back against Iran inside, in that situation, they will face lots of problems inside Iran. Now, they, they have this strategy that there is an enemy outside, we have to fight to push back, that's why Khomeini said, Khomeini said, if we don't fight in Damascus, we'll fight in Tehran and, Kilma and uh, Kilmancha. And when, uh, uh, I think, uh, Vilayati said, I'm not sure if it was Vilayati, Damascus is more important for us than Ahvaz. So what does that mean? There is a problem outside. We have to fight outside. And then we'll come back to your problem. We recognize your problems, but it is not a good time for that. To, to look at it. So in this situation, yes, they are weak inside, but outside they are flexing their uh, you know, muscles and using the problems with that, like in, in Iraq, what happened in Iraq after 2003, there was a problem, chaos in Iran, they used that problem to, to control the situation in Iraq. We have it in Syria, we have it in Lebanon and Yemen. So, in my opinion, there, are no big, uh, no, there is no contradictions. Yes, Iran side weak. We see the, the protests everywhere in Iran on a daily basis. There was something in your, today in the newspaper that, in average, every day there are 16 protests across Iran. Every day. This is the average. So, the second question, yes, I think it's in, in the benefit of Saudi Arabia and Iran to have a reasonable price, oil price. So they, they, they worked on that in 2016 and 17, and maybe they now will work on that. So that doesn't mean, uh, and they, they work with the Russians as well. So in the, the coordination between Saudi Arabia and Iran in oil prices benefits both sides. But that, that, that will be limited in, in, on the oil price and OPEC and has nothing, in my opinion, to do with other political issues. And that's why even the Hajj, remember when the Iranian uh, uh, team went to Mecca to, to, to see the last year, 
to see the, 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 the preparation for Hajj. People think, thought, and we've seen it in the media, that the, there is a breakthrough in terms of relation between Saudi and Iran. And myself, I thought, no, there is nothing, because this is a separate issue. Has nothing to do with the political problems between the two sides. So the Hajj will be limited to the Hajj issue to have uh, to make sure that Iranian Iranian people perform Hajj and they go back to their countries. But this is, has nothing to do with the political pro uh, uh, crisis or political problem between the two countries. So, there's uh, any question uh, in the audience, please. <laughs> Dr. Aslami, thank you very much. Uh, had, as you know, I had the pleasure of hearing you speak at the Foreign Office in the UK last year, so it's great to hear you again. I, I thought your point about not being able to deal with the government um, and being unable also to deal with the Supreme Leader and, and the IRGC was an interesting one. Um, and the, the question is really in two parts. If, do, are you concerned that you're underplaying the internal dialogue in Iran between the government and the Supreme Leader? So, for example, um, it's pretty well known that the Supreme Leader was against the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, yet he was persuaded by the government to enter into that deal. So are you underplaying that internal dynamic in, inside Iran? And the second piece, if you're not, and there's no point in dealing with the government because they don't have any effect, effect on, the, uh, on the strategic circumstances, and you can't deal with the Supreme Leader and the, and the Security Council, uh, then what is the alternative? Because strategically, the alternative ought to be, if you believe there is malign Iranian behavior in the region, to try and contain it, and yet the containment doesn't seem to be working. <coughs> in terms of uh, internal dynamics, yes, there are uh, internal dynamics inside Iran, but uh, uh, it's not. I, I would disagree with you in terms of uh, nuclear deal. Yes, in public, Khamenei had to say that. To say that, he said, "I am against the nuclear deal, but I will go with you and see." But we shouldn't trust America. This is what he said. We shouldn't trust in America. This he has then. If anything happens, they then say, okay, remember, I told you. If, if, if everything goes smoothly, then that by his promise, uh, he agreed on that, and let's, let's continue. And remember, the whole change in Iran came after two, in 2013, built on the, the, the dialogue, the, 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 the nuclear issue. Remember uh, the, the collapse of Iranian currency in, in late in November 2012 during Ahmadinejad. The dollar was uh, one dollar was 1,202 man, and in two months it, it reached 4,000, 3,050, so almost 50%, uh, 100% more, just in two months. And then they faced lots of problems inside in terms of economy. They had that they, that time they had no chance but to start a dialogue with the, with the West. And uh, we remember the, the nuclear issue started during Ahmadinejad, not, not Rouhani. It started in, in, in March or April 2013. So, and uh, Rouhani came to the office in 5th of August 2013. So, yes, there are maybe problems inside Iran and different parties, but they cannot, as I said before, two fires, they cannot do much about it unless Khamenei has given them the, the green light, which is the foreign policy and the national security. And the nuclear deal is in for both sides. It is foreign policy and it's national security. <coughs> in terms of uh, uh, containing Iran, Yes, we are not doing well, I guess, in, in that. Uh, which we have pride in Yemen. We are, yes, of course, we limited the Iranian presence in, in, in Yemen. We managed now to control it, at least 85% of Iranian, uh, of Yemeni uh, uh, 
land, but we still have threat from that side. We want to see the muscles and uh, uh, hitting Saudi Arabia. We have so far more than 100 missiles fired towards Saudi Arabia. So we need to do more than that. But more, we do need to, need, we do need to uh, have a better, let's say, a more nationalist uh, government in Iraq. Uh, not pro-Iran, not pro-Saudi Arabia. They look at their own interests, but not following the Iranian agenda, not following the Saudi agenda. I was in Iraq two, uh, three months ago, and I met with, with Ibadi, Haider Ibadi. And we are discussing uh, with a big group, not government, but think tanking, uh, American, Europeans. And we're talking to, to Ibadi, and he says, yes, I would, I would love to, would like, and I'm working for that to, to have uh, a very independent Iraq politically speaking. And he said, it's, um, uh, and we have Iranians with us in the group. They said, okay, would, I'm working for an, a very independent, politi politically speaking, Iraq. But you, I need help from our Arab neighbors. And I think if we manage to, to have that Iraq, we can limit Iranian uh, interference in the Arab countries. In Syria as well, it's worse. In Lebanon, people now working in that. Now we have a different approach to, 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 to Lebanon with the, uh, my good friend, actually, Nizar Alola. He is now in, chief, in, in charge of the, the Lebanese file. And he is doing, a, to large extent, a good job there. So I think we need to push back against Iran. Not the same what we do in, in Yemen. We'll do it in Syria or Iraq or, Nary, or Lebanon. No, I think we have to have different we have, should have flexibility, and, and uh, we should have, uh, we should be pragmatic sometimes in order to push back against Iran. And I think in uh, the main situation in Iraq, it's very important. If, if we go invest in Iraq, I think it will improve the relation, and that will help, because I've, what I've see, seen in Iraq is totally different from what we've seen in media. Uh, really, Iraqi, whether Shia and Sunni, would like to have a better relation with Arab countries. I will see it when the Saudi national team went to Basra, and we see it when the media delegation went to Baghdad and other cities. We were working the Saudis, they weren't, because they, had, they didn't have very negative, uh, uh, what, what call it, experience with the Saudis, but they have it now, with the, with, they will see it on a daily basis from the Iranian side in, in Iraq. Well, the question is, It's a great pleasure to meet you, Dr. Mohammed. With regard to the containment of, of Iran, Iran has a clear, uh, let's say, a national project. While we are, until now, hesitant about really taking a real initiative in terms of uh, confronting all those threats, not just in the uh, top north of uh, uh, the Arab country, uh, Iraq, and Syria. But the threat is closer than that, even in, in Jordan or, or Yemen. Now, until when we gonna be delaying, uh, you know, taking the real step of announcing a federal GCC? This is step one. Now, step two, I think we have uh, given Iran one of the biggest uh, let's say, gift when we still in our literature address the uh, national identity being Sin and Shia. And I think we should write this off permanently and starting from now. Third, we have two projects, which is the uh, Nation of Islam, when one out of Tehran or Qom, and the other one is from Ankara. So we, we need to take a real step and build on national identity through project like a federal GCC. Yeah. Uh, it's very difficult to Because Try. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to achieve. Uh, we, uh, we, we wish to reach this point that we have federal GCC countries. 
there was initiative, you know, in, in the, in, was it in Kuwait summit, 2014, yeah? Yeah, 16, I think, yes. No, no before that. 14. No, no, no. This, the GCC summit was in Kuwait 2014 or 13, huh? No, no, no. Before 17? No, no. For, before the, the, the Gulf, uh, the GCC crisis. So I think it's 14 uh, and, or, or 13. When we had the, the Gulf Unity project, it was King Abdullah. Yes, it was 14, I guess. Now, yes. That was Riyadh Summit. When we did the announcement? Yeah. That was, that was but it was, seven. actually, it was in 11 in Bahrain, I guess. No, no, 11 in Riyadh. Maybe. I, I, I can't really remember. But it's, in any way, the idea was there, but reality in the ground is different. The, I think the, the will is there, the, the need is there to, to, to have a federal. GCC countries, but right now it's very difficult because if we have the crisis, the, the Qatar crisis, you cannot have a federal, openly speaking, you cannot have this opinion, uh, uh, you know, implemented or, or, or taken seriously with the reality that we have a problem with, the, with Qatar. We need to, to reach a point where when we are in a better situation, I don't know how long would it take, but I think we, yes, we need, maybe, in my opinion, we can take it in, th in a shorter or smaller, uh, uh, well, let's say, for example, Emirates, Saudi, and Bahrain. People think of that way, and then, because we know the Omanis, they, they were against it in Kuwait, that's why they said it in media, that's why they, they are against it, because they think it's not, we are not ready in the GCC for unity, because we couldn't achieve much in, in the, uh, the, uh, the Cooperation Council. So, yes, this is good, but we are not ready. And Kuwait situation is different because of the, you know, the security issue. I hope so. I hope that. I hope Maybe that. I'm we take not, uh, one last question before we yeah. finish the conference. Sure. Is there, is there, yes. Oh, there's two more. Um, hi. Uh, uh, we'll President take Donald Trump is expected, according to analysts, to withdraw from the okay. Iran nuclear deal. Uh, I, I was say. wondering. Can you speak lower? So, President Donald Trump is expected to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. Um, what would Iran's reaction be to that? And what do you think the role the countries in the region, uh, like what role will they play? Okay. I take one more. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for all the information you've shared with us tonight. Actually, we grew up with, us, with this idea that the Iranian project in the region is a sectarian project. But after some research, especially in the Balkans history, we came up with the conclusion that it's not a sectarian project, actually it's an ethnic project. So what huh? would, ethnic project. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. <laughs> so how would you comment on that, please? Okay. <laughs> uh, nuclear deal. Uh, nuclear uh, deal. Uh, I'm not sure if Trump will withdraw from, from the nuclear from the nuclear deal. They may there are attempts from from Cameron now. Oh, Mr. Macron. Yeah. Macron, yes, now in in, in 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 Washington, try to to convince Trump not to withdraw from the nuclear deal and try to fix it. But there are, I think there are. Uh, Trump said this. I, my negotiation now will be with the U European countries, with three European countries, not with Iran. And if, if, he, if they will be flexible in terms of uh, uh, imposing more sanctions on Iran, I think Trump will accept that. This is one I point. The Iranian reaction, we, have, we heard it yesterday from Zarif. He said, 
if the American United States withdraws from, from the nuclear deal, we'll start enriching uranium next day. So, and that, that's the whole problem with the nuclear deal. It's fro it was frozen. If we are very positive, we'll be frozen, but not taken away. So Iran, in any time, can go back and develop its, its, its nuclear program. In terms of uh, the, the problem with Iran, is it ethnic or, or sectarian? Uh, I wrote two articles about that, maybe. So <laughs> bad. Uh, the whole problem, maybe, before Iran was a Sunni state until 1501. The challenge or, or the rivalry between the two sides of the Gulf, if we say it's ethnicity, Persians and, and Arabs. If in pre-Islamic period, we cannot ignore that. There is a problem in terms of the way Iranians, not, not all of them, but the image of Arabs in Iran is, is very negative. This is my PhD dissertation. And my supervisor was Iranian, originally Iranian, but uh, Iranian Dutch. We have it from Shobia after Islam. And we have during 19th and 20th century, Akhun Zadeh, Akhan Kirmani. You have it from Ahmed Kisrabi, who's uh, if not a Persian, but he was pro persian But we can solve that. And that's not a threat. That may be a cultural problem, but not a real threat to our countries. Our threat comes from sectarian issues, because we don't have Persian minorities in our countries. So Iran doesn't have this, but they have the Shia minorities, who you, not all of them, parts, very small part of the Shia minorities in the Gulf or the Arab world uh, were, were used by Iran for political purposes. So this is a sectarian issue, ideological more than anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Just before uh, concluding, I would like to, to tell you about the next event at WIWS will be about why fighting terror in West Africa matters to Europe and the Gulf will be the 6th of May at the Four Seasons. And the guest will be, the speaker will be Brigadier General Philippe Boutineau from the French Ministry of the Armed Forces. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.